We're also um, very pleased that you've come. We notice there are some very interesting people in the group, including some <clears throat> of the most distinguished members of the cybernetic community from around the world. So thank you all and others who are relatively new to cybernetics. So we'll try and deal with this for everybody. Stephen, uh, you said you wanted to start with cybernetics, but before you do that, um, you did some fantastic work you 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 t keep telling me that you talk about models you think models all the time you're thinking with models what is a yeah. model to you and what's that got to do mm. with what you did for bt yeah sure uh yeah I i'm just going to go back to a conversation we had maybe just a uh, literally just a week ago uh, angus and we were talking about models we were talking about cybernetics and we were talking about the how interdisciplinary cybernetics is and I was, when I was reflecting on, uh, it's all about models here. So when I was reflecting on that after our conversation, you know, I've had quite a number of different jobs. Uh, I left school and uh, I went into the uh, Merchant Navy and I was a marine engineer. I was there for four or five years. But when I was there, I was always building models of the ship in my mind's eye. You know, it's really weird. I can see the piston going up and down inside the cylinder uh, I can so see what do you sword. mean in your mind's eye do you mean you literally see it oh no I can see it I can see this in my mind's eye yeah right I can see the individual sort of molecules moving around uh, you know I can actually see that, you know when a chemical reaction takes place the binding energy is released right and it creates potential energy and kinetic energy I see all of these things in my mind's eye you can't see kinetic energy I cannot believe that you no, can I see... can I can see these things easily whizzing around so you right, see kinetic yeah. energy or yeah. you see a model of kinetic energy. Yes, yeah. I know. Well, I assume everything's through a model, of course. Remember? Uh, oh, okay. I think. I, I mean, in terms of my philosophy here, is I, I don't. Believe, we've, we, I mean, we haven't got direct access to reality. Uh, our sort of our reality is is mediated through our senses and thought processes. So we build a, a, a representation of whatever there is outside. I do believe. I believe there is something outside. Uh, but of course, what we're doing is we're building models that enable us to survive. And the issue we've got here is that we don't build truth models. Truth models uh, really aren't worth anything. Uh, I assume if we could build them, they might be very, very expensive. But there's no way at all we, we could do that. But from an evolutionary perspective, it's all about survival. So we need models of survivability, models that help us to survive. We see all these beautiful colors out there, of course, but these colors aren't real. They're rendered in our consciousness to be able to help us to be able to create a, a distinction to be able to differentiate certain things in the outside world that will help us to survive so that's the common theme but anyway so, so can, i went can, in I, can I interrupt yeah, you yes okay yes yeah, so you say for survivability which is of course a you know a classical darwinian model but it's got heavily thrown out i mean in in Maturana is talking about biology of love. There's a mm. lot of work that's been done in modern biology, looking at sure. mm -hmm. other other modes of learning, other epigenetic forms of. So that now the model of certainly survival is totally necessary. Organizations, people, and so on have to survive. Nobody's questioning that. Okay, <clears throat> so we have to, we have to be able to navigate our way through the world in such a way that we survive. But don't we also, as part of that, especially if we're dealing with humans, doesn't that also include, for example, love, sociality, and things like that? Isn't that also part of the model that we're looking for some values? Mm. Uh, and in perceptual control theory, there's a whole structure <clears throat> of values and how we make decisions pl plays out in a relationship between those different things, which you could say is different different ordered levels of model so there's a sort of base of level course, of, model, yeah, of course yeah, and yeah there are higher yeah. orders right of course yeah yeah no exactly no exactly and i and i, and I don't have an issue at all with that and I, I i don't see why that maybe seems to appears to be in conflict with what i was saying there it, it wasn't there. as long as it's uh, as long as nobody thinks that you're only thinking about one oh, no, thing, not at all. One, one dimension I'm, i mean not at all i mean the reason why i'm thinking dimensional because invariably i'm using these models in a workplace right right uh, and they seem to work very 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 well uh and uh so if I just move forward on that, Angus, yeah, I, mean, I could talk all day about issues how I'm using good. models very effectively uh, when I was we'll, at sea. We'll come back to it. When we almost lost the ship in the Bay of Biscay, these mental models that I have to be able to understand what to do in that situation when a ship was sinking, uh, 
you wow. know, it, it just shows you the, the power of that model. So I wanted to try and maybe focus in on maybe the models that we build in our brain rather than the maybe the genetics, the, the, the intergenerational learning that we get that maybe is how love becomes manifest in that type of, of situation, in that type of evolution. And I do believe in evolution. I do believe that we started with nothing. Uh, and the chances of us coming together to have something that's sustainable was almost close to infinity. But of course, that's played out in a very large universe, of course. So miracles can happen uh, in a very, very large universe. But I wanted to be really try and focus in on the interdisciplinary nature. I mean, I feel as if I've only ever had one job, and that job was building models of whatever it was I was responsible for. The models might change, but at the end of the day, they are models. So maybe I might just take a bit of time identifying what I mean by cybernetics. So to me, a cybernetic system is a system that has intentions. It uses some sort of model in order to be able to determine that that direction, that strategic direction, and to be able to sail the course. Models are not right or wrong. It's all about adequacy of purpose. So it gives us the opportunity of being able to improve the model so it becomes more refined to meet the needs of the situation that we find ourselves in. So effectively, from my cybernetic definition, models have to be able to learn, and we've got to be able to, to learn to use the model. Okay, so this is where maybe first order and second order learning comes in. First order learning is learning to use the model. Uh, and interpret the world through the model. And that's non-trivial. Just take maybe like the, uh, Newton's law of gravity, right? So with Newton's law of gravity, can an, an average individual explain away two tides per day, right? They might think that initially, oh, we have two tides per day. This is my sort of view of, uh, of, of Newton's uh, sort of law of gravitation. And I can only see one, one tide per day through there. And you might have a temptation to change the actual model, whereas there's nothing wrong with the model. So it's non-trivial, but we need to understand how to use the model to interpret the world through the model that maybe someone else has given us, okay? Uh, and secondly, we have to be able to change the model to be able to learn, okay? So we need, we need a model to be able to do that. And that's what I would call second order learning. But the int interesting thing about a model is if I'm going to ask questions of the world, I've got to have some way of grounding the answer. So I should be asking questions really through the model. Unless I want to go way off target, okay? I should be using the model to be able to ask a question. And when I get an answer to that question, I should be able to uh, say, take, if, we, if we looked at the model in terms of scaffolding, in terms of a structure, I guarantee, so I'm effectively standing on a strut of that Sorry, structure. I want to pull, uh, yes, can, I, can I stop you, right? Yes, sir. Because I want to take this, which you are describing, which is a bit abstract for some, mm -hmm. and ground it with an example and then come back and make sure that we also talk about what you did at BT before yeah, sure. we go on. Yeah. So um, a person wants to make a cup of tea, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they have an idea of what's, they know what is involved in making a cup of tea. So you can call the process, I think you might say, that my knowledge of how to make a cup of tea is a kind of model. I have to go and boil a kettle. I have to get a mug. I need to get a tea bag and so on, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Milk. So I have, a, I have a series of actions that I'm going to have to play through in order to do it. And in each of those, I have to navigate the world in such a way that I do it with sufficient, adequate precision. Mm -hmm. So when I pour the water, the boiling water into the mug, it goes into the mug and not out of the mug, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the precision that I have has to be adequate. And in order to do mm -hmm. that, I'm correlating different aspects. I'm correlating what I'm seeing, but I'm also correlating what the sense of movement, the proprio, proprioceptive movement in the hat, in the arms and the body is telling me about where my hand is. I'm, I'm feeling things and I'm looking at things yeah. and I'm turning this kettle and, and I have an idea that if I pour it, but now it's, let's suppose the, the kettle, the hole in the kettle has got some obstruction in it. So the water comes out at a, at a funny angle and it starts looking like it's going to miss the mug. Then I make an adjustment <clears throat> to the mug to bring it back in. So it goes in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now what, I think you're saying is that that everyday experience, which is design, it's intentional, we're trying to make something happen, we're controlling actions, we're modifying those actions in the light of what we find in the world. The same kind of thing scales up for resolving the problem of a ship that's going to sink or managing a large division of thousands of people. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, mm -hmm. we go into it, but we're talking about some 
similarity or homeomorphism between those different kinds of experience. Is that right or wrong? No, I mean, I, I, I think that's very much, uh, uh, it's very right. Going back to your sort of example of a cup and a kettle, of course, there's a lot of sort of uh, muscle memory, of course. There's exactly. a lot of memory in your, your systems there. And maybe when we then relate that to a, to a ship and maybe uh, having other people. See, I think uh, if I go back maybe to, to where I was many, many years ago, and I used to think about what is it that makes an organization of people different from the type of models I would be, say, building of a, of a ship, of a motorbike. And when I was 14, I had a motorbike. And I wanted, I've always been interested in the control systems of a motorbike. I wasn't bothered about anything else. I wanted, to, if the motorbike broke down, I needed, I needed to understand how to be able to repair it. So it was always the control system that I was very much focused upon, right? So I could build a model of the motorbike and I was in, c in control of any issues that arose as a result of uh, the motorbike breaking down. And I would go on to something a wee bit more complex than a motorbike. It might be a car, then it was a ship. And then I started working for the health authority. I was designing, uh, I used to be a process control engineer. So I used to design the, the, the control systems for uh, the air conditioning system and so on. But I'll put that to one side, we'll maybe revisit that area later on, uh, Angus, right? When I joined BT, something sort of different happened. I was now say, slight exaggeration, but I'm not actually far from it. I was in charge of the UK network, right? And for the first time, I couldn't see the network. And maybe I never would because I had that many people working underneath me that effectively uh, they were the, the mediation between my, my ideas and what should be going on, on in the network. So, I had a slight so that would be problem. a bit like pouring the water into the mug without being able to see the kettle? See, it would be. No, exactly. That's you couldn't right. see the mug. You couldn't yeah. see what was happening <laughs> to the water. <laughs> and you're trying to make it happen, right? So the issue, the problem I had there is that rather than building a, a network, a, a model of BT's network, which is not really too difficult, I needed to build a model of something else. And that something else is what I would call organization. I needed to build a model of the organization. I needed to understand that people weren't a chaotic ensemble of, of, result, of, of humans coming together to be able to fulfill, fulfill, fulfill a certain intention in a way that, that all had a purpose. And we needed to somehow cohere the activities of the individuals to give us oneness, to give us wholeness. So uh, that sort of then moved me into a slightly different area of management. Now I was faced with not building a model of a motorbike or a building a model of a ship or an air conditioning system. I was trying to build a model of a management system that was looking after the operation, okay? And uh, I spent a long, long time really just thinking about it. And I think a lot of my learning really is very much experiential. All of my learning is bottom up, just observing and building pictures right. in my head in terms of what's going on, trying to, using Occam's razor, if I've got two, two models and one uh, does the same as the other, but one's a lot simpler, I'll get a hold of that simple model because it's a lot easier to understand it. And it's a lot easier to make changes and then to be able to anticipate the effect that that will have on whatever it is that I'm actually doing. So let me dance into that because I, I share entirely your fascination and uh, desire to understand wholeness and, and work with it and bring it about. Um, and the sort of patterns that you've been talking about. But one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot is your... Um, you're, a, I don't know how to call it, maybe you can tell me, but it's, you have like a mission to improve the variety in an organization. And for you, that variety, and this is where it chimes with me, that variety is connected to enabling individual people, all of the people in the company to in some way work. So they belong to that order that you're talking about, that coherence. That, that, and yet that, they're that individual autonomous people doing their own thing. Can you say what, how that works for you? Well, and how does the model help with that? Well, first of all, I need to be able to understand uh, what an organization is and what a, a, an organization is not. OK, uh, and I'm going to really try and answer that question uh, using some of the, uh, the readings that I've been doing in the area of consciousness and the work of Giulio Tononi. Right. And Gi Giulio Tononi has a model of the brain uh, and that model of the brain is meant to explain a way really consciousness. If you take the neocortex of the brain, the neocortex of the brain doesn't have the, the same number of neurons as the cerebellum. And yet the cerebellum is not conscious and the neocortex is. So what is it that's special about the neocortex that makes it different from the cerebellum? 
and actually gives us awareness that makes us feel as if we are here, we are in the world. Okay. Uh, and uh, how do I use that in, in terms of an organization? And indeed, right, I want to also explain away the corporate seagull. How do I actually build a model that explains really the, the mentality of corporate seagulls? What's a corporate seagull? Okay. So a corporate seagull is, uh, I would say, a, right, I'm going to use, a, I think, a set of terms. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if, there were, if, I, if I should use them in this sort of way. I would say a corporate seagull is a low variety amplifier. Right. The converse of that is a high variety attenuator. Right. So that really brings us into a model. That doesn't that help us. There's a whole bunch of people that doesn't help. <laughs> right. It helps uh, me. Yeah. But it doesn't help a lot of people. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> right. So what I mean by a lower variety amplifier is that a corporate seagull is a lower variety amplifier. In as much Did, right. Are you talking about seagulls or are you talking about people? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about system. people, right? right that go in. Right. The, but, but anyway, let, let me explain away that behavior. Go ahead. Uh, in terms of the simple model that I want to try and uh, d develop uh, based on the, uh, the, the, the work of Julia Tononi, right? So you can imagine we've got three, three circles, right? We've got a, an inner circle, uh, an, an outer circle, and an outer, outer circle. So we've got, we've got three concentric circles. In the middle, I'm going to call that middle circle the system. Okay, the circle surrounding the system, I'm going to call that context. And the circle outside, circling the, the, con the context is going to be called the environment, right? So this is how I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, so in a system, I'm going to say that system, uh, I, would, I, I would rather use the term organization. So maybe I'd, I, yeah, that's, that organization, you're part of that organization if you are both affecting that organization and also at the same time being affected by that organization, right? And that's the essence of a conversation. A conversation is both way, both ways. It's a dialogue between two individuals. You're affecting that individual and that individual is affecting you, right? And we can use that again, that very, say I'm building models all the time. So let's, so in a way for me to have a conversation, there's gotta be some sort of shared understanding. There's gotta be a shared model. So uh, I remember some work done uh, by Paul Pangaro and he uses the term a shared white space. So when we start, when we're starting to talk about a subject, it's important there's some sort of overlap between what, what it is what we're talking about. So we imagine we've got a, a shared white space, okay? So I would argue that within that system, we've got a, a shared white space between the actors within that system that are coupled through a conversation. So now I'm gonna go out to context. Within context, we are only ever affected by the context, we don't affect the context, okay? If we affected the context and that context affected us, that would become part of the organization. That would become part of the, of the conscious organization, okay? And in the environment, the environment doesn't directly affect us and we don't affect the environment. Unless we go to the nth degree and I didn't particularly want to go there, right? So effectively in the environment, we are, there, there are just dots around, there are just things, there are just objects in the environment, right? That aren't heavily connected to anywhere else. So we've got this loose connections and we've got no connections in the environment. We've got a one-way connection between the context and the system. And then we've got the system that connects together. Okay, okay so look. And I, think, and I think the corporate seagull, right? is actually in the context domain where they can come in and severely affect the system, but he can only perturb the system because he's not part of a conversation that's, that's taking place within the system to be able to maintain stability and drive it effectively in a given direction. All he can do is perturb it because he isn't connected conversationally. Okay, so let's see if I understand you right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you've, got a, you've got a new boss, let's say, comes into a team. Mm -hmm. And at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, this boss, it's just one of a variety of scenarios. The boss comes in and they don't really understand him. She, he does not really understand the whole situation, mm -hmm. all of the complex aspects of that situation and the different people in it or what's really going on. But they have a feeling that they wish to make a difference. And so they start taking actions within it. Now, this... In order to look at this in more detail in the way that you've been using cybernetically, people are interacting with each other. In the simplest case, you and I, two people are interacting. But in fact, although you and I are interacting, everybody else 
is a context because they're all there. If there was just the two of us and we were on Skype, we wouldn't have this picture and so on. We'd be having a different kind of conversation and we wouldn't need to worry about whether we were explaining things to people. Yeah. They equally are responding and they're part of this conversation. So the boss comes in, he's maybe dealing with one person, but there are other people in the room, other people in the situation, other people affected and may not be aware of everything that's going on with all of those people. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the conversation is a kind of coupling. So just as uh, a fox chases a mouse and eats the mouse, that's a kind of coupling of sorts where the mouse becomes the food for the fox. Mm -hmm. So in a conversation, people are joined by a conversation and they interact and we become a context for each other. And this word context is really interesting because it's con text, it's with a text. And what is a text? anything in our experience, everything in our experience that has meaning is a context. So anything we pay attention to that has meaning for us is a context. So a new boss comes in, they're reading the signs of what's going on, but they may not understand enough about what's going on. So they take actions that change what's going on. People interpret that, they start to be change their behavior. And if you're not mm. careful, you can be disruptive and damage what's going on. So of course you, you can damage yeah. the the situation. Yeah. This is the sort of thing that probably everybody who's on this could describe. Everybody knows about it. What you're yeah. saying is that there is a precise method of describing this within cybernetics based on context, conversation, purposes of people. And then these two things, attenuation or the ability, the thing that cramps. So that's when the guy doesn't really know what's going on. Mm. So his knowledge of the situation, his picture of the situation, his understanding of the situation or his model of what's going on is limited. So therefore he'll make bad decisions. And amplification is about expanding that in some way. And that would lead to the high variety situation that increases the freedom of people. Can you say something about that? Yeah, so let, let's just go back to the, the question you, you asked me just a moment ago regarding low variety amplifiers. Having gone overall into that framework, right? So I could view that the, the corporate Segal being a low variety amplifier, right? Can go into a system, right? Without properly understanding it, right? So understanding in a way helps to constrain the types of actions that you take, of course. If you're very knowledgeable of a, a given situation, right? That limits what you, what you actually do because you're aware of the implications, okay? So the corporate Segal, of course, does not, that have, a, does, does not have that awareness. And because he doesn't have that awareness, he doesn't have the same number. Well, he has those constraints, but he's not really aware that, that he has these constraints. And like maybe someone who is very knowledgeable of, say, of, 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 a, given, of a given situation. So in a way, that increases his freedom, but that does not increase his freedom to act requisitely. Okay. Of course, anybody can make a decision and uh, that could be the end of their lives. They've made the wrong decision and they've gone off a cliff edge, right? So in a way, that the knowledge of that system is so important if you're going to intervene and make a change in it, okay? So that, that's, that to me is, a, is an example of a, of a low variety amplifier. He can amplify his variety, but he's not amplifying the variety in a requisite way. And this happens time and time and time again, of course. So you built some systems for BT, for example. You can choose a different one if you like. But can you just talk us through how it functionally improved people's variety in a way that was good for the company and good for the people? So what system are you referring to there? Well, for example, you built VSM when you first went in with a telephone. Uh, yeah. That was, or when you went to, uh, when you were dealing with the decommissioning, and you said, and you created a model that enabled teams yeah. to have better, yeah, better control of their local self-organizing work. Yeah. So let's. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the uh, the last jobs I had in BT before I, I retired from BT, I'm um, going back about two years ago. Is the responsibility. Even we used to be a chief scientist at BT. That's yeah, it. I was a chief research scientist at BT, yeah. and, and my sort of research theme uh, was in the area of organizational sort of cybernetics. Okay, uh, and that's about effectively you know building and implementing and using more effective models of the operation. But the challenge that I had uh, was to be able to build a decommissioning uh, plan for the the old switching network that we've been using for the past 30 or 40 years. So we've got this sort of massive switching network that consumes about two billion pounds worth of energy 
to you. It's very resource hungry. If you think about it, every every time you walk along the road, there's lots of cables <laughs> directly under the pavement, and these cables are consuming electricity. There's a current and there's a heat being generated there. I just wonder how many extra sort of degrees that maybe that network, that's un- underflow heating for the whole of the UK, you know, is adding to the uh, uh, to, to the to the, uh, the the global warming. Uh, but so my role was to be able to decommissioning the actual network, right? And decommissioning is not the same as adding, or not the reverse of adding new capacity to, to the network. If I'm going to add new capacity, invariably it's the customer and the demand that customer brings on us that tells us where to go next. So we can go there, we can actually work out what the demand is in that area, and we'll put the right amount of network in place. So that's the goal-oriented behavior of cybernetics. It, it, very much so. But, but this is I've, still goal oriented, but the goal is to get rid of stuff in so, some efficient uh, and effective yeah, way. Yeah, but the thing is, I would challenge that goal. I mean, in terms okay. of what I had, you know, because it, 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 it actually gets people to, to start looking in the wrong direction. So my challenge was to decommission, decommission uh, BT's uh, UK network. And the network was, you know, connected to 20 million customers. Uh, we had about 5,600 exchanges with a, a very complex transmission network linking the switches together and you would connect to the switch and you're using this, 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 this network lattice to be able to make calls across the UK. So we had a decommission. It sounds like a fairly sort of straightforward sort of problem that anybody could tackle. But this is where, again, this is where low variety amplifiers and high variety attenuators come in, come in here. And I would like to think of myself, because the way I've got time to think, so I'm, I'm effectively, I would like to think of myself as a high, as a high variety attenuator. So the issue is, is that uh, I said that decommissioning is not simply just the reverse. Of, of, of so what's an capacity. attenuator for all the people who've never, who are not coming from an engineering background? So, to, so an attenuator, in, my, in the way that I'm using the, the term here, is to be able to, it reduces really... Uh, it doesn't artificially, it requisitely reduces the options that you've got in order to be able to do something in the network. A prime example, uh, I'm just right, so I've got 6,500 exchanges. I've got about 20 million circuits running across the entire UK from A to B, consuming a lot of resources. So uh, let me build a, a, maybe a simpler model of the network. Uh, have we all heard of the game Kaplunk? Have you heard of Kaplunk? So Kaplunk is a, a cylinder with lots of straws going through the cylinder. And on top of the straws are marbles, right? So I think that is a good analog of BT's network. The straws represent the transmission systems, right? And the marbles are the switches. So once I remove all of the transmission systems, there's no need for the switch. And the, and the, the, the marble will just fall to the bottom of the cylinder, okay? but it's going to be a little bit more complex than having a single cylinder with four or five straws going through with three marbles on top of that. Effectively, I've got about five and a half thousand of these cylinders, and I've got about a 20 million circuits going through. Not all of them, I don't you know, maybe it's going through one or two. There might be one circuit that goes through about 50 of them. There might be another circuit that actually goes through about 100 cylinders. So the challenge I've got is that uh, which circuit do I move first? And why do I move that circuit first? Which circuit do I move second? And why do I move that? Because the ordering of that removal makes a significant difference to the costs associated with maintaining and running that, that actual network, okay? But then again, we talked about the decommissioning of the network, right? It's, it's as if someone's already done their homework and uh, they've said to me, Stephen, I know the answer, we need to decommissioning the network. But we're only talking about a part of BT's UK network because the, U- the other UK network is using WDM technology. Hey, it's using IP Stephen, I'm coming in here because part of yes. the thing is we, we have only so much time for this conversation. Right. Okay. So what, I'm, what I want to check is this. Supposing I was to give the following summary of what you're saying and what we talked mm. about. You've got a situation which is technically super complex as as engineer lots of lots of wire switches devices and things like that and there's a certain amount of intelligence behind it and what you want to do is decommission it and let it all collapse you've also got thousands of people hundreds of people 
Uh, but I, no, in terms of context, this is important, Angus, right, before you want, I'm saying I don't know if I need to decommission it, right, because I need to look at, look at the, right, the, the context at which that decommissioning might take place within. So I've got to look at the totality of the network. And surely the remit at the no, end of the, the day... No, but the overall network is to be decommissioned. What you don't know is which bit to decommission. Oh, no, not just that. There's other bits of the network. We're also growing. We're growing other parts of the right. network as well. We're gonna, so th we've got to be left with some network so in case. But, but there's a whole the lot of network, it. and within it, there's a bit yeah. of it that has to be decommissioned. No, 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 no I'm, I'm saying, uh, Angus, I'm no? not taking that as a given. I'm not taking that as a given. Right. Okay. I'm saying we've got Why a not? network, right? I'm taking it. Well, that I'm trying to explain here. I'm sorry. We've now got this total network that's providing services to the, to, to the customer, right? And really what we're trying to do was to continue to provide a certain range of services to a customer infinitum, you know, ongoing basis, right? So the modeling work would be a lot different than just building a model of decommissioning and decommissioning the network. It's because of that, right, that when I was doing some work in terms of the finances, you know, I could save the, the, the business hundreds of millions of pounds, right, by taking account of the other, other networks that are already in place. Okay. You mean you could you reuse some of what was there? Uh, no, it, it was a bit, wee bit more complicated than that, but it's really looking at the totality of the problem, right? Right. So this, although this was, so now this is the key in terms of the simple model, right? I'm trying to get key concepts across. So we had a system. My system was decommissioning. Of the, of the network and the context was the other network. So I wanted to, to absorb that context into my model of the system through conversations, right? So I says a system comprises of a set of conversations. Now that I'm having conversations with other networks outside of what I was decommissioning, right? I've increased the size of the system. I'm incre increasing the quality of the conversations. So the actions that we undertake are different from what the actions I would undertake by just looking at the decommissioning aspects of the network. By doing that, I think uh, very crudely, it saved the business about a quarter of a billion pounds by doing that. So you took the total, instead of starting off with what was given and said, do this, yeah. what you did is you looked at the totality yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. And then you understood the con. And you're talking about how, how the networks interact as conversations. No, of exactly, course, precisely. there are yeah. also people having conversations, but you're actually saying the systems themselves are having conversations. Mm -hmm. And you're going from that totality. And from that, you're doing the filtering that's necessary to get to that which has to be decommissioned, that which has to be modified in some way, that which doesn't need to be affected at all. Effectively. Yeah. Finding some kind of sequence path through that so that the people who are going to be doing the work are directed towards the right kind of things that have to be done in the right kind of sequence, rather yeah. than going off randomly mm -hmm. or just running amok, trying to get rid of everything in some mm -hmm. kind of way that's made sense to them. Yeah. So my, my focus about a quarter was... of a billion pounds of saving. Yeah. So, so my focus there was on effectiveness, not just the efficiency, people being able to having their right. activities requisitely scheduled so they can get from here to B. Uh, very, very quickly and efficiently. If that activity... How did that doing... feed through to the people? What happened? With oh, no, we, I mean, it was a team on the through... ground. What happens? It, oh, right. Well, well the, the models that I was building, there weren't system dynamics models. System dynamics models are models from, uh, from top down, down to Mother Earth, down to bottom, right? I was effectively built, I built a very detailed model of the network and I was using cellular automata as the, as the modeling sort of methodology that I was using, right? Until within got, a VSM framework. Within a VSM framework. And so I got Which is the viable got, system model. It's a cybernetic yeah, model. No, ex exactly. So I, I would be starting with using cellular automata, right? And then once I got, because the, the problem with math, remember mathematics is the science of patterns. And I've got to have a pattern there to describe mathematically. But of course, at a very, very low level, it's almost like random. You can use cellular automata for generating sort of random numbers. You know, you can't predict what number is going to come next. But if you've got the cellular automata algorithm, you just need to be able to iterate it for the next iteration. And you've got a, a random number being generated. But effectively, that was the nature of the network behavior at a very, very low level. I couldn't use a pattern. Patterns, the, the, the patterns weren't there. The patterns just don't exist because the, 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 what, what is there is just a, what appears to be a lot of noise, so, but can so, be generated by using, a, by using a different modeling paradigm. So what I want to do is to trans do a translation, yeah. cybernetic translation, I, because um, there's clearly a huge application of cybernetics into the world of technology, and it's been very 
heavily used in software, robotics, AI, and other things. And it can be used to solve technical problems in the way that you're describing. But this uh, project that you did over several years involves a lot of people. And from our conversation, from our title, right, because we haven't even got to this, this the uh, we've got to corporate seagulls, but we haven't <laughs> talked about the smart Alex. Yeah. <laughs> you know, arguably you're just a smart aleck here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, if we want to translate this back to all kinds of social encounters, the, the, the manager who comes into the team or leader, the design of, of a new housing estate by an architectural team, mm -hmm. the creation of, um, the, the creation of products, of course, for people, but also the creation of, for example, teams, organizations and so on so that the organizations work mm. how would you translate um so i would i would for example take what you've just said and say uh, i work in the field of brand it's one of the and identi organizational identity it's one of the yeah. key areas that i work in uh, i have seen a lot of models of brand used by a lot of marketing teams and all of them lack the requisite variety it means that the the scope of what they consider to be part of the identity of an organization does not have all of the dimensions that actually belong to organizational identity. Yeah. For example, um, very few, if any, marketing brand models include the business model or financial model of the organization, how it makes money, how money works through the organization in its understanding of its identity. But without that, you cannot really effectively deal with questions like pricing at, sure. at the sure. front uh, end, uh, uh, right? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the investment in new design, R&D and things like that, that's a, that's a very significant factor from the point of view of uh, the financial model. And when it comes to asking for service, the classic problem is people being told to give the customer fantastic service and then being told that the financial model says <clears throat> that they've got 10 seconds to do it with, right? Or we can't actually have human <laughs> beings doing it at all. In fact, it's way too expensive. Like Zoom no longer gives you a help support because you know, you've got to go read it online if it's there and if it's not there tough because it's too expensive and too difficult in today's world to answer it. So that's a financial model. And so I bring that up as just one of a number of examples of how when considering the identity of an organization, which is a system, a system five level in cybernetic terms in VSM, mm -hmm. within that, the model that's being used for understanding identity doesn't have enough. So what happens is the different functional groups like marketing, finance, and so on, operate in some kind of tension or conflict sometimes even. Yeah. And people on the ground who are doing things are not given guidelines that are clear. And what do those guidelines do? Guidelines enable people to act freely. They go, you can do anything you like as long as you don't do this. And these are the sorts of goals that we have in mind. Can you help it to happen? Yeah. So my wife, if, you know, if my wife was trying to control my arm all the way through making the tea, uh, I'd end up spilling the tea. But I, she doesn't need to do that because I know how to do that. All she needs to know is, can you make it a bit stronger or make it a bit weaker? And then I can do it. In the same way, translate it up to the scale of com complexity in an organization. How, how does this, what I'm talking about very briefly, map across? And then I'm, I think we should probably ask for a, <clears throat> some question or something from the people who are here. Mm -hmm. but can you see any relationship between at a cybernetic level the problems of, um, at an, of the engineering structure, the, eng the, the technical structure infrastructure that had to be operated on, and you ended up giving guidelines to people, and the social organization of a company. Right. Uh, I thought where you were going to go there with that question there, Angus, is that you were talking about, you know, the businesses really have got their own departments. You've got HR. Uh, you've got the remuneration, uh, you've got finance, you've got the operation, you've got the cost of the services, the goods, and so on. And it seems in, a, in an organization, these are normally managed separately, right? Right. Uh, because it's very difficult to integrate the data together between these domains because you can't exactly. easily have a conversation. A finance person can't talk to an operations person because really you don't understand what impact 
maybe a certain operational thing's going to have directly on finance. In, you know, it's all always done indirectly. I'm doing some work at the moment. That's exactly in, part of what I was trying to get at in terms of this top level I, I, understanding doing, how they are all integrated. So I'm doing some work now in North America for uh, 135 businesses under a holding company. Uh, and I'm doing precisely that. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing in the finance side. But the problem with finance is that I don't know really what the current P&L is until three months later. So I've got a three month period there. So I'll show you what I'm doing here. So I've got the P&L. And what I want to do for this company is I want within this business is I want to build a P&L on a daily basis. Why can't I build a P&L on a, day to ba a daily basis? So what I've got is I've got all the transactions coming together. From HR, I've got all the remuneration schemes coming together. Uh, I understand the cost. I'm actually almost computing. I build the P&L dynamically anyway, but there's always other costs that come into the P&L that I don't know about. So what I'm doing is effectively I'm using a common filter. So a common filter is what got effectively man on the moon in 1969. Uh, effectively, it's a, it's a dynamic model and a measurement model that's coming together. So it's like effectively dead reckoning on a ship. You use the sort of the common filter to be able to predict where you're going to be the day after, uh, the next day, the next day, and the next day. And maybe every, say, two or three weeks, you might be able to take a sighting. You can see the sun and you take a sighting and you've got effectively a measurement. So effectively, you can reset your position, right? So what I'm doing here, in order to be able to take account of the different types of time constants in the, in the system associated with these different types of businesses, I'm using the common filter and I'm using a, a model, a measurement model to be able to then uh, give me a, a real position at the end of, of two months. That will actually change, because uh, I've obviously got a certain amount of drift that's occurred in the first place because of the dead reckoning process. But what I can do is I can calculate the degree of drift, right, by the new measurement, and then divide it by the number of days in between. And I can actually sort it, just when you're, when you're looking at currents, ocean currents, right, I can compensate for that ocean current now because I know, I know the strength of that current. So I'm going to put a vector in place that's going to go against it. So over time, I've got a better way of steering the ship through commercial space. But the important thing about having a PL on a daily basis is that people have got a feel for what's causing the PL to be low, what's causing it to be high. They make better reads and put in better interventions in order to be able to recover a situation uh, that's going against them. Okay, so what I'm doing, again, I'm using cybernetics, I'm using the models, I'm using this model to be able to show how all of these different uh, departments within this organization can affect each other. And we can then have, would you believe, the model helps us to be able to, to facilitate, to mediate a conversation between individuals within different domains so we can make better decisions. Okay. okay. So the common filter, you've got a, you've got a, and cybernetics, uh, as you know, and many of the people on this group, uh, on this call know, uh, comes from the Greek word for a steersman, a steers mm. person on a boat. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very relevant uh, <clears throat> image. <clears throat> and I'm very interested in how the the rutters were developed uh, in the sort of around 1600. They were using rutters because they, they could figure out where they were on one dimension, but not on the other dimension of the earth. So they had to find, they had to get lots of detail about how you went from one place to another, including things like, well, what's the color of the sea and which direction are the currents going? Yeah. Because they could only, they only had one of the two dimensions needed to position yourself exactly. Yeah. So, so what I've got there, Angus, I use the concept of rates, right? My model is all, about, is all about rates and vectors, right? So I've got rates that are going against each other. And the net result, of course, is the p and and the profit when we break even. So uh, as a way of trying to, to show these rates coming together so people can understand what impact they have is uh, I can come up really with a net vector crossing the, the, the fixed cost line. Okay. And what I do is, and this is so all I'm asking, doing, I'm yeah. interrupting because I'm Sorry. asking you to right. do another translation. So what you're okay. saying is there's a ship, it's going through the water. Yep. It knows what the wind is doing. It knows it, it's got some sense of what's happening with movement of current. That's so these are all vector. the, the so wind these, are the these are all the rates. To, yeah. Right. It's trying to get to somewhere. So it's sure. pointing at it because of the current, because of the wind, it points out somewhere else in order to end to where it wants to do. You, and it yeah. figures, am I going to get there? And, and it's tracking from the signals it gets from time to time, whether it's on track or not. Exactly. You're taking that and you're now translating that 
that whole mm. conception of how to do it into how you financially steer an organization Precisely. by so getting I'm flows with, of data. Now, so I'm, steering with the organization I'm asking you to do yeah. another steer, right? right? Okay, yeah. Okay, how do we, for example, steer a conversation like this? Mm -hmm. How does a leader in an organization steer people in order to amplify their freedom, mm -hmm. in order to give them more scope to use their own skills, their own ability, and so on, and yet deliver results that are coherent, that are in conversation with others, and produce the outcomes that are needed for the people who are needed it and the organization? How does that work for you? Well, it works by being able to mediate those conversations through a model, Angus, because people, I mean, if you even just take maybe a... a, a looking at the bathtub dynamics of John Sturman from MIT, water flowing in and water flowing out of the bath. How does that affect the water level in the bath? And, that, and, and he was sort of running this as a, a thought experiment on uh, MBA students at the university. None of them, none of them could get that, that problem right, and that's just dealing with three variables. So first okay. of all, we can't have lots of individuals trying to look after something that's very, very complicated, having a conversation directly with each other. You've got to understand the impact of your actions on another par party's domain right and we do that through a model so the model is helping to mediate the conversation okay i get that i mean yeah we we, we live in a modern industrialized world in which for example good software systems good technical systems good mm. infrastructure of that kind sure. is really necessary to run large organizations no question yeah. Yeah. but where if we fold this all the way back to the beginning of the conversation you talked about how for you, the word model stands for all the representations that people make in their, in their minds, in their consciousness, with the help of the apparatus of the body, mm -hmm. in order to be able to under, have a representation of the world in which they're operating and mm -hmm. responding to the signals mm -hmm. that they're getting through that process. Sure. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that make up the model for those people if we completely leave software aside, completely leave engineering, I mean, <laughs> right, right, okay. right, which I know you might find difficult, but <laughs> yeah. you actually have no difficulty really, oh, because you do it all the time, yeah. is that they are things like the values, the things that matter to you. It matters to you to increase the variety in an organization. Mm -hmm. And or, or constrain it, more so. or constrain it, depending <laughs> on what's required. I, I, but I would say invari in, invariably it's always constraining it. People okay. have got too much freedom and it's done through ignorance. So we need to constrain it as a generalization. We need to constrain it or uh, guide it. Give, yeah. In other words, guide it or guide it. Oh, no, but what yeah, matters yeah. is that it's it's something that matters to you. That's something you really want to have happen. And that's a value. Therefore, it operates within your model of behavior using your language mm -hmm. as something as a, as a value that guides what you do and what kind of work you do. Mm -hmm. So within an organization, when people, for example, share values, when they share the purposes of the organization, when they share certain goals, certain outcomes, like a project to build a website, for example, mm -hmm. or to design a new, a new product offering or something like that, that they collaborate together on that. So they're in conversation at collaboration towards some kind of goal. And what cybernetics did we didn't really talk about that. Cybernetics brings back goals. It brings, it reintroduces design into science. It reintroduces purposefulness. <clears throat> and the models that you're talking about can be models of shared values, models of shared language, models of shared pictures of where we're trying to go. For example, the vision of an organization when they share it, that's something. You and I had some kind of picture of what this, co this conversation would be like. We're adjusting and learning to the situation that we're in. Maybe well, <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. But, but at any rate, we had a picture of what we were trying to do here, and we're working towards that. So that, too, is a kind of model in your language. I might call it something other than a model, but I can relate to it as a model. Sure. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. So what... what so if I'm looking at the softer side of things that I'm trying to do there, I guess rather than having something that's always sort of written down mathematically and following, I, I mean, I do believe really that they're an organization is really the, the computing substrate really for the model anyway. So we, we implement it uh, within the organization. Uh, but if you think about it in, in the way that I'm proposing that people behave differently is that I need people to be more conversational. So they're not going to become isolated. They're not going to be sitting in silos, right? They're all going to be adding value together to be able to improve the viability of the business and seeing it succeed, right? Right. So I, I think in that perspective, that would put two massive ticks in the box. They understand what's going on by being involved 
that involved in a very rich way through a conversation, not just the ability of being able to ask questions and, and be listened to, but there's always feedback given to the individual in the way that I'll be running these businesses, because that is the best way of amplifying variety, right? The number of interactions uh, can be proved mathematically. And this, this was some work I was doing, maybe I can cover it uh, at one time at Oxford, at the Mathematics Institute at Oxford University, is being able to actually quantify the increase in information that we get from a, from a conversation. Okay, and how that reduces, it increases the size of the search space, okay, because you've got more permutations resulting from these two organizations interacting. All of a sudden, you've got a more complex problem to solve, but we've got AI and we've got computers to be able to help us to be able to do that. But out of that, really, you're, you're constraining the total number of options because a, a transmission person won't have the total freedom to, to operate if he's now constrained by the switch, what the switch manager is going to do and vice versa. So right. in a way, that's opening up the, the, the area of possibility. So we're integrating. The integration increases the search space, uh, and it becomes more of a problem to differentiate it. The differentiating was the removal of the first straw out of all of these 20 million straws. That's differentiation. It's creating a distinction. Which straw do I move first? And that generates a lot of information. Information is generated by being able to re reduce that search space down to a single pixel, down to a single point. We're maximizing information as well. So, wonderful. And that's a perfect uh, segue to what I think we need to do because we've just top of the hour, we've got mm -hmm. half an hour left, and mm -hmm. I think we need to involve our participants in this who have been participating by listening mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. um, so what we want to do is to take that broad space and we want to focus in mm -hmm. on some questions and um, maybe what I think would be useful. Uh, Stephen, chip in with what kind of question you think would be useful. But to me, what would be useful is if somebody says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you explain X? Mm. The second question would be, yeah, but how would that apply to such and such, some situation that you're in? And thirdly, I have this insight, if you can say it very briefly, I have this understanding that this is what you're talking about. Is that right? Okay. Mm. So who would like to ask a question? And John will probably also help with this. You might have to unmute yourself to ask a question, but to begin with, just kind of indicate that you have a question or... Wave that... your arm or something or put a little flappy sign up or anything. <laughs> So let me let me kick Hello, it off. Then. Nice um, oh, sorry, Miguel, you're coming in, Miguel. Morgan. Yeah. So um, I have a, a question, which is specifically around uh, large enterprises, and um, I, I I focus quite a bit on on this concept of coupling, taking place either one to one or or in meetings, and I, I immediately thought to myself, okay. Well, all of this is taking place, obviously, within a very small group of people. Um, a large project such as the network one that you discussed affects a very, very large group of people, which none uh, uh, the great part of which you're never going to be in touch with or communicate with have that coupling. So <clears throat> is there anything that you, you can attempt to try to get some quality um, communication in either direction, either from that population of people that you really can't reach out to, or uh, which is you know, what I think is more, uh, much more easily achieved, communicating out to that group of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, of course, we don't have to have maybe just a single meeting that will bring all of these individuals together, of course, we have a, a meeting of meetings of meetings. So you, you maybe have a, a hierarchy where you could potentially within one or two layers get this exponential explosion occurring when you're able to make the, the necessary connections. But of course, you've still got to have these conversations in a coordinated, a coordinated manner. So the people at the lower level can report into a, uh, I mean, the way that, I mean, there are, there are start doing that is building maybe a, a, a conceptual model of the network to understand what the, the main sort of components are and what the main issues are of these components. I mean, as an example, one of the, the big issues that we did have uh, in our network is really a, a port of a line card. You know, you imagine you've got some computer, uh, computerized equipment, you've got a card and you've got individual ports in the card. 
and you'll get certain types of failures between the two. So we will have to bring a team of, of experts within the company together to try and focus in on that. But effectively, the key is really just building a model of the network with the key components, how they relate together, and see how that just starts to form. You might think, well, we've got a strong conversation here because these two systems affect each other directly. On the fringes, maybe that small system is only affecting that individual unit. It's that unit itself that affects the rest of the system. So I think I agree with you. It's understanding how to maybe intelligently partition that space based on the, on the degree of coupling between the individual components and how maybe one idea or one initiative will affect an, another area. And again, modeling that. And then through the model, we can maybe make sure that having sharing that model, you know, we can remember, you can easily share a model on a, a meeting with 30 or 40 people coming around a virtual table and explain the key aspects of the model. And then they can take that model away and then we can make adjustments to the model. But the important thing there is we only ever have a single model. It's no good having two models because you've got two silos. They're not connected. They aren't connected conversationally. So they're not part of the same organization. So effectively, all they can do is to perturb each other. So we need it maybe to, to minimize perturbations that are taking place within that project space, right? By being able to have the conversations taking place between what, would, what could have resulted as a perturbation by engaging in a conversation means you get a resolution to that, uh, the, that impact, what, would, what would, would have been a perturbation, but mon managing it in that way. So it's building a model, assessing maybe it's the impact of people's decisions and the degree of coupling required in order to come up with a resolution on how best to take this massive complex area forward. Yeah. So Is coupling per se actually let me just come measurable? In here. Oh, sorry. So Stephen, you, you, you um, sorry, Miguel, but um, a lot of your work involves modeling in your mind including yeah. but also visually and mathematically mm -hmm. and turning that into software that models the world invariably yeah, yeah. a lot of other people's work involves also modeling that doesn't go anywhere near building a software system and may not be math probably isn't mathematical in the way it works mm -hmm. and i think this is relevant to you miguel as a person who's working with social media and another way of answering your question which is very different, and I'm giving it in order to show how the same underlying thinking, the same underlying principles can work in very different ways, is that it also affects millions of people, the whole, pop, you know, the population of Britain. So millions of people, not just thousands, are affected by that. One of the, one of, and investors and other groups like this. So one of the things that BT would do in a situation like this, or any company, would be that, for example, they'd hold press releases or briefings for press, and they would be wanting to make use of the press as a way of communicating what they were doing, how they were doing, how it would affect, how it wouldn't affect people badly, what they were doing about it, and so on. That's a way in which you know, a small group of people can brief a group of journalists, and the journalists can write to a large number of people. I, I was a, the chairman of a creative agency that worked with a client, and we generated half a billion communication contacts for a particular in fact launch of a new car through some kind of mechanism like that which was amplifying the communication process why is pr loved by companies because they don't have to pay they tell somebody about it the journalist has a good story writes the good story and tells the good story the job of the journalist is to check that the story is a good story that it's a true story that it's not a fake story and to tell it in a way that people will that is believable and interesting. And um, some of the journalists in the world are not that, uh, not that good. They're not that interested in checking these sorts of facts, and some of them are. Um, and one of the things that we've got in today's world is that people are making heavy use of the whole world of media in order to be able to put out news that is not news or fake news or whatever. But when it works well, that is a completely different kind of flow of managing the communication process and interacting with people. Now, it's a bit one way, it goes out as a letter, but there will be also direct communication with customers and things like that, that will be taking place from the organization. Angus, I'm going to stop you and intrude if I may, because I'm Go ahead. Of time and I know there's a queue of questions. So John Morgan and then Janos Korn, please. So John Morgan, turn your microphone on. Okay, ah, thank you. Uh, my question was probably an observation more than a question. It was about uh, what might be termed the scheduler rates when Stephen was talking about 
different values on the vectors. Perhaps it's something to pick up later on at this time. Okay. John, What's yeah. the observation? What is it? What are you? Uh, well, I, I suspect that, for instance, on a weekday, the values would be higher than for a weekend, and on okay. a bank holiday, they'd be different as well. So, gotcha. Yeah, could be. No, I, yeah, I'm very much aware of that, John. I mean, in terms of really trying to solve that issue, of course, I've, I've got a very, very uh, sort of complex forecasting module as well, so I can make a prediction of demand. So I use really the. But this means of, patterns, doesn't it? Of, you're of, creating, yeah, you're finding patterns. This time, I'm using patterns, right? And what I'm doing is, I can, I can, I can, I can really pro rata the fixed costs based on maybe the, the demand on different days. So on a Sunday, nothing would happen. But remember the fixed cost, anyway, maybe I could talk well, about Well, I can tell on. you, yeah. That yeah. John is from the background from Deming. So he wanted, part of yeah. his interest yeah. is to make sure that variations and things like that are genuine variations and are properly managed. And you're not just chasing that today's result means that you react mm -hmm. to today's result, but tomorrow it goes in another way and the whole system yeah. Yeah just, on that, on, yeah, just on that, John, I've, I've really had a, a very sort of difficult time over the past few weeks. We've got COVID, right, in the States. I do a lot of work in the States now, do forecasting for all of these businesses. And of course, we've got Thanksgiving coming. Thanksgiving is coming along on Thursday, right? You can imagine the patterns there, the pattern swings. So I haven't used a lot of insights that only the brain can generate because I can't mine it from the data uh, and talking to others. But that's so, it's so important. So I, I use these patterns to be able to pro rata or anything. Yeah, effectively. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And Janos sure. wanted to Can ask a question. Janos, yeah, sorry, Angus. Hi. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you, you said at the beginning that uh, we have uh, no access to reality. And um, how about the senses? Oh, no. I, I, what I said, Janos, is we don't, we don't have direct, we don't have direct access to to, to the to the outside world, whatever there is outside there, the outside world is mediated through our thought processes and our senses. Well, and anyway, the, the senses are the connection between the brain, mind, and the uh, outside world and reality. Yeah. And, uh, yes. So, uh, if um, we have no connection with reality, how do we build models? It's oh, no, not sorry. that we have no connection Quite, with yeah. reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so we have senses that pick up, but the, each senses about, pick up aspects of... Our senses pick up aspects of what we're looking at or experiencing, Janos. And we the then... The sorry, but Janos, I thought I was answering your question. You've got some more question to ask. I'm talking over you, so please yes. say what you were trying to say. I, I said you didn't say anything about the symbolism that we use to create models. And finally, how do we use models to learn about the empirical world? That's it. So okay. Answer now, if you want. I think both uh, Stephen and I were talking about the fact that we have, Stephen was talking and he talks about building models and I talk about build and, and he used the word representations. I talk about mental pictures and representations, German word Vorstellung, so people build up pictures in their mind. So that what the senses reveal of the world, which is an empirical experience, you see the cloud, you see the stars, you see the moon, you see the rivers, you see a person walking by, you see some shit on the pavement that you're walking by and you want to dodge it. So you have all of those experiences of the world and you pick them up through senses. You also experience your body movement, balance, and all, all of these different things. And they give you certain experiences. And in that sense, your body is also part of this world that you're experiencing through your senses. What's but the, the senses the by themselves have to be correlated with each other in order to give a coherent reality. And we only pay attention to the aspects that interest us. So symbolism, for example, something has a meaning to me that it does not have to someone else. I don't go around, for example, paying a lot of attention to the clothes that people wear. It's not an important to me, but I know people who are constantly looking at what people are wearing and what their hairstyle is like. So different things have different meaning for different people. And out of that, they filter the totality one of the things Stephen was talking about is there's this huge totality and you want to take it all in. But all of that, none of us ever takes in the whole totality of what is there to be taken. We take a filtered reality and we build through the addition of thinking through cognition. We add to our sense stream something that makes sense of it. And in that, 
very often symbolism, metaphor, and things like that play a role in that process. And from that, that gives us our internal picture of the world to which we respond. And built into that are our emotions, built into that are our wishes, <clears throat> built into that are our values, the structure that goes on with that. And coming up, we've got some sessions on perceptual control theory next month and the month after that we'll go into some of that in a lot more detail. Uh, ben Sweeting wants to come in, please. Thanks, John. Yeah, I just got a follow on question from that, I guess, or um, kind of, I'll say there's a question first and then I'll comment and give it back as a question. So I wasn't sure what the, whether it was helpful to um, think of models in terms of representations. So I guess the question is, what happens when we do and do you need to? And then just to explain that in, in response to um, Yanis's um, point. So um, I think we can think of models and modeling in different ways. And I'm from a background in um, teaching and studying and practicing architecture. We use a lot of models. Mm. Some of them are made of cardboard. And sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the models are buildings that mm. don't exist yet, which is a very strange um, thing, right? So these are the kind of models we build when we're designing buildings are really different from the models we make of existing buildings to represent them. If you think of models in terms of representation, then buildings are models of cardboard models. We make some cardboard and then we build something 50 or 100 or 2000 times bigger, which is a way of modeling of um, another model. And this idea is the distinction between models of things, representational models, models for things, which are models for doing stuff, something. And I think what Stephen is describing is a model for doing something. I would agree, Ben, yeah. And if, if you think of that, it gets you out of, um, it helps you bypass the um, uh, talking about the real, because the real isn't, you know, what we're, we're the modeling is, we're modeling ways of acting in our experience. And it actually doesn't matter. To, if we think in terms of representation, we end up building more, um, we, get, we get the sense that a more accurate model is better Whereas actually sometimes to come back to the variety point, um, a less accurate model um, can be more helpful. So this is where we take detail out of a model. For instance, we'd, we'd model something 50 times smaller mm. or so on. So we talked about making a cup of tea. That's also uh, building up a picture or building up something in order to be able to negotiate a process for something, which is at the end of the day, a cup of tea. Yeah. How does, does that, fit in with what you're saying uh yeah so i mean i would you know uh i have a i'm creating um my piaget terminology is escaping me but i'm essentially creating a model for how to do that yeah um through yeah. my experience mm -hmm. i haven't modeled uh i haven't represented an aspect of the world i've mm -hmm. created something within my operational schema I'd say a big part of cybernetics is that it's focused on four things. It's about, you know, people, people are purposeful. They want to make things happen. They want to do stuff. And cybernetics is a science and a design and a discipline and so on that helps people to figure out that. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's been so influential in the creation of design. It's why it's become important in biology, which is about people do, living things, doing things to live, for, for living and so on. And all of these new fields that have come. Um, John, do you, you have someone else who wants to ask a question? In, please, yeah. Can we bring I would like to, to, to make a question, if I may. Yeah, just hang on a second. Let Malcolm come in first, please, and then go back to your other question. Malcolm. Hi, yes. Um, it, I, I tend to um, agree with what Stephen is saying about thinking through models, but I would go further. Um, maybe Stephen is very, very skilled at this, but I would actually go as far as to say as we all think through models we mm -hmm. cannot help it uh yeah. things that have been said in you know janos and everything uh, isn't it something like about is it two million or two billion data points per second of which we can process about 200 so there's a philosophical idea here that's often called constructivism we construct models but perhaps another way to think about it is many some of you i know have read the book metaphors we live by by lakoff and johnson and one of the ideas behind this is that we cannot help but through metaphors. Uh, another uh, perhaps suggestive book is um, 
the old Russian formalist, uh, Frederick Jameson, he talked about the prison house of language. I think it's similar to Wittgenstein's ideas is that we are bounded by the language we actually have. Yeah. These are all models. Now, I think it <laughs> relates to something Stephen was saying earlier about trying to find some kind of unified goal. The fact is, many of you, us don't. Uh, many of us don't even have a unified goal ourselves, hence cognitive dissonance. And I think this is the kind of like the challenge, perhaps, of how do you actually articulate these different models? Conversation mm. popped up a minute ago, but I'm afraid I wasn't listening. But mm. it's something to do with the fact that how do you bring a conversation, an articulation, an orchestration between these different ways of thinking? Mm. Uh, and that for me is a kind of like the navigation, the cybernetics, the cyber 90s mm. type idea mm. in terms of meaningfulness, the creation mm. of shared as well as disruptive as well as dissonant meanings. Yeah, I, I agree so with what you're saying. David, then, please, David Dewhurst. Mm. Is, uh, I, I think we've given quite a lot of time to unpacking epistemology and so on. I've been working on it for decades. I'd like to get uh, go back to being a bit more concrete from the broad abstractions, uh, generalizations that you gave us, uh, Stephen, because I don't think I could sort out decommissioning uh, BT. Mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure from what you've told me um, so far. Like, I'm curious about whether you, the size of the subgroups you had, how, for example, similar is, is your structure to um, what Beer did in Chile? You were both using Kalman filters. Were, did everybody have access to the outputs there? What did people not like about it and you, had to modify either them or the um, <clears throat> system. I, 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 I just would like a bit more grip on the, yeah. the hardware or the See, people. We might be uh, getting another question from Raul before we answer this, but you know, I, I've seen it's the system in detail. It's, it's, it's the real enchilada, it's uh, very detailed. Uh, Raul. I want, to, I want to make a comment. I thank you, thank you Stephen, for your contribution. And uh, uh, perhaps the, 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 pain, the main point that comes on is, con is related to David's uh, point is, uh, and Malcolm's is constructivism. Uh, you, you, when you talk about models, you are not uh, talking uh, strictly about uh, representations. You are talking about conversations of people who are creating some meanings in their conversation. And is that that it generates a model that uh, uh, somehow is diverting according to who are the people involved in this conversation. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the next point that I wanted to make there is that uh, uh, clearly ideas of amplification and attenuation that were uh, used at the beginning and then later on, uh, are ideas that uh, are deeply connected. So what I would like to, to, to hear from Stephen, uh, how does he see the connection between a, a constructing a model, a, connecting different participants through amplifiers and attenuators, and generating <laughs> some kind of uh, performance in the situation itself? Mm -hmm. So. Can, can you help us, Stephen, by connecting amplification, attenuation of variety, constructing models, and performance? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think certainly when I uh, sort of try and, uh, again, get people working together uh, and being able to even share maybe their, their mental models in order to be able to try and have these mental models coming together to create the system that's working is in oneness is really through through a conversation and how i would define a conversation Raoul, is really a, a, it's effectively coming together over a shared white space this is a sort of a shared mental model that we can test because we can ground that model in experience in mother earth conceptual models can't we can't tell whether Two, two parties really share the same conceptual model, 
because you can't go out there objectively. This is subjective. So how do we go out there in the objective world to be able to ground the ideas that we are, are, are talking about? So effectively, I've got this sort of idea of the shared white space. And what the conversation does, the conversation, I would actually measure intelligence as the rate of change of that shared white space. And it's that rate of change of that shared white space uh, that I would, I, would, I would term intelligence. So the degree of intelligence is the rate at which that shared white space is actually increasing, getting a common understanding of the actual problem. And that acts as the interface, isn't it? That's increasing the bandwidth, the communication bandwidth between the two parties. Rather than having just a very small overlap, we've got a quite a large overlap now. And this is very evident from the type of conversations that I have on a regular basis with, with Angus. Initially, there might be very little shared white space, but there's got to be something that you've got in common. That's the common scaffolding that we have between ourselves that we can start making adjustments. We're starting now to ask questions using that scaffolding. And what I can do is add a bit of scaffolding on the existing scaffolding. So that's starting to grow and grow into the other domain that I'm trying to be able to get a better understanding of. So I'm starting now to ask questions through that shared mental model from my perspective and, and then develop it and grow it. So to me, that is actually increasing the variety. Right, we're, generate, we're creating new variety uh, and increasing variety and reducing uncertainty and making better decisions for the, for, for the system as a whole. Stephen, let me try and answer yeah. David's so question just, very, very let briefly. Me just complete, uh, let me just complete one. I, I added the idea of performance, uh, Stephen. Yeah. And the, I, I think that it would be useful that uh, this construction of the model through all these conversations. Yes, that's the important, yes. Uh -huh. uh, how does that relate to performance in the, uh, whatever you do with amplifiers and attenuators really is not here or there. Mm -hmm. It is what is that at the end of the day you produce and is the outcome or improvement of the situation. Mm -hmm. So how do you make that connection? So how am I sort of saying that the performance, the performance of the decisioning process, we're coming together for a reason, okay? So we've got a problem we need to be able to solve, okay? And what we want to do is to uh, uh, improve the effectiveness of our decisioning. We want decisions to be highly effective, okay? And I think the best way of testing that is by people getting together and all voting with their thumbs up effectively that they agree that this is the the best direction for the business to go in. Initially, if we're working in our silos, we've got separate vectors moving in. Almost some vectors could, some vectors literally can oppose each other. They're going in opposite directions. So there's no benefit at all, no benefit at all to the business, but there is a cost there. If we can get all of these vectors, right, that are relevant to each of the domains being properly aligned, okay, that has to be a good thing. And if we can get that alignment through a shared mental model, of all of these different domains coming together, that must inc improve the performance of, of, of the actual business. But because the project is a one-off project, we can't compare it with other projects that other people have done because that never ever happens. And, and in invariably in a social system, you can't rerun the experiment, okay? So I think the best we can do is for a lot of the, the experts that are involved in this project to effectively give that thumbs up to say, yeah, I think we're doing a good job here. We've got the support. You don't have any tension that's being created between the parties because the whole idea of the, co the conversation is to be able to reduce the tensions that are building up because of silo working. Angus, I think you Dave, need to bring yeah, Dave, as my friend. Well, yeah, so just David, the you asked about how does it work? How does it work? It's a very sophisticated, complex system. He spent a lot of time talking to various people involved in the various areas. He always does that. He built a VSM model. So for many of you will know that that means there's a sort of high level policy. There's mapping the future, operational control, things that maintain stability, operational stuff that happens. And it's built recursively or hierarchically so there's the whole the whole division and then every single unit within it and the units within those and the units within those are all structured in this model plus the resources that they have the people the teams and so on the actual all of the end all of the machinery on the ground the networks on the ground the switches on the ground all the kit that's on the ground is built into the model all of the people that are there the situation with them. And so what he's able to do is find a mapping between what is the state of play at the, at the ground zero 
machinery, engineering, technology level, and what's the organizational structure at all levels of detail recursively. And using that was able to be able to ask questions like, what if we do this? What if we do that? And could answer specific questions and could generate schedules of things to be done. I'm sure he could spend, well, I know he could spend hours talking about that in a lot more detail, but just to give you a, f a flavor. We are coming up towards the end of the time I don't know what Stephen's situation is, but after we finish, we Stephen and I may not stop immediately. So if there are some people who want to ask some more questions, happy to hang around. But we'd like to let people who want to go, need to go, because now is the time coming, feel free to go. 